Hello, my name is Peter Shields, and on behalf of Airmet Scientific, I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's webinar, Mitigating Weather Risks Using Weather Sentry Online, to be presented by Matt Saunderson from DTN. In today's business environment, there are many decisions that need to be made based around prevailing weather conditions. Accurate prediction can allow businesses to optimise their planning and operations, as well as increase safety and productivity. Matt has over 20 years experience in this field, and I'm sure you'll find his presentation extremely interesting and informative. So I'll now hand over to Matt Saunderson, Director of Australian Operations for DTN, who's kindly agreed to present on the topic today. So over to you, Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. So as Peter mentioned, my name is Matt Saunderson. I'm based here in Brisbane uh, with a company called DTN. So I'll get straight into it to try and give you a bit of information about, about mitigating weather risks. But seeing as you probably haven't heard of DTN before, I'll, I'll give you a quick um, rundown of who we are, but the, the topics that I'd, I was hoping to take you through today are, first of all, let you know who DTN are and, and how we fit into the weather space in Australia, um, and then really talk about Weather Sentry Online, um, both a bit of an overview and then get into a demonstration showing how you can mitigate weather risks using Weather Sentry and, and be able to have additional functionality that you can get through existing weather sources that you might be using now. Um, and so hopefully by the end of the session today, you'll see that you can take a bit more control of the weather. Um, you can understand what's coming and what decisions would be worthwhile taking um, ahead of the impacts and, and try and be proactive about weather impacts rather than reactive on a range of different areas. Um, however, weather impacts you, whether it's lightning or air temperature or um, humidity, um, there are ways that you can make good decisions around weather and weather sentry can help do that. And then finally, as Peter mentioned, um, if you type in any questions as we go, we'll have some time at the end to work through those. Um, so just quickly regarding DTN, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I figure a lot of people haven't heard of us. We're an American company by heritage, but we have a strong presence here in Australia. Um, and what we seek to do is be a global provider of independent insight and analysis. We're not just repackaging other people's data, we are offering our own um, proprietary content as well as supporting that with other valuable information that um, we can bring in from the marketplace, knowing that people want to have the best information when they make decisions. So flowing on from that insight analysis is then digital decision support tools um, using our, our content. So the big picture of how we do that is, is those three areas at the top. We're seeking to enhance operational efficiencies for businesses and that's a good prompt just to, to stress that we are purely business to business focused. We don't um, provide any of our, our different services that we'll see in a minute to media companies or to, um, to the mass market. We are purely business focused and so all of the systems that we have, uh, whether it's Weather Sentry or, or the back end of those, our data centres or those sort of things are designed around robust, reliable services to business customers. And so we'll talk about then in, the, in below that orange line there about how we deliver that. But what we're seeking to do is enhance these efficiencies, help businesses make smarter decisions and help businesses manage their risk. And so we do that by providing these critical decision support tools, whether it's analytics or visualisation tools, we provide our own proprietary content to support mission critical operations at our business customers. Um, whether that's weather intelligence we're talking about today, um, it might be pricing information, um, it's another part of Rafa that I'll show shortly. Um, and a third area that isn't the focus today, but it's a part of what DTN does, is provide greater supply chain connectivity. Um, and so whether it's oil and gas or agriculture or different market spaces, um, we're a strong player in those areas around the globe. So. The other areas, apart from weather, um, and weather will be the focus, but just as a bit of background to DTN, the areas that we do um, are active in uh, are these three here, plus weather. So refined fuels, um, where we're focused on the downstream supply chain there, um, fuel terminal information systems, those sort of services we offer in, in that space. Um, agriculture, we have uh, quite a suite of services spanning things from commodity pricing and, and pricing outlooks or seasonal outlooks, for global markets through to market news and opinions from our own um, staff looking at, at global agriculture um, activity um, through to specific weather content, for example, utilising on-farm DTN weather stations to um, get in those local observations for the farmer and combine it in with this market information and pricing information 
Um, and further than that, a comprehensive suite of back-end tools where we're really supporting farmers as CEOs. We're giving them accounting services, planning, business planning services, help um, them with purchasing decisions and combining all that with the weather data, the commodity pricing information, um, all those different aspects. So agriculture is a large part, as is trading. So I mentioned there with the pricing information, um, whether it's agricultural commodities or, or energy trading, for example, we have a platform called ProfitX that um, is utilised globally for, for trading activities. However, the focus today is weather. Um, that's my background. Um, um, Peter mentioned that um, I've got 20 years experience in the industry, so I'd give you a bit of background about me as weather as well as how DTN fits into the weather space. Um, I'm a qualified meteorologist, did my graduate diploma in meteorology with the Bureau of Met back in 1997, um, and then worked with the Bureau for 10 years in Brisbane and Melbourne. Um, then about 10 years ago, moved into the commercial weather space. Um, and so back in 2009, was involved with a company delivering these same tailored weather services to weather sensitive businesses. So still not mass market, not media, it's supporting information to help businesses make better weather related decisions. Um, my role is the Director of Australian Operations here for Australia, so I see all of our operational activities um, and there's two arms to that. There's the weather services side of the business, which Weather Century fits into today. Um, and we've got a team based here in Brisbane that is involved with the delivery of weather services to customers. There's also the other side, the hardware side, which is weather systems. And so we've got a team based out of Perth delivering um, the spectrum of, of weather stations, whether it's high-end aviation standards, uh, where we put them into airports for the for international air navigation and domestic air navigation, um, right down to agricultural type weather stations. Um, we don't get into the, the air quality side of stuff. Um, we'll let folk like AirMet deal with that. We're purely in the weather parameters. Um, and then making use of that information. If we're putting in a weather station, um, it's to be able to get that data to be able to then get insights into that data and then support our customers to take actions from that information. So on the right hand side, you've hopefully had a bit of a read of that while I've been talking, but on the right hand side, I think that sort of teases out some of the value um, to DTN and what we're about. Um, we're about being accurate. So for the last 10 years, an independent group called Forecast Watch have been assessing ad forecasts against our competitors and the National Weather Service in the USA and the Bureau of Meta in Australia. Um, as USA, we've had 10 years straight as the, the most accurate um, weather provider for temperature and rainfall forecasts. Um, in the last couple of years in Australia, which is the only time we've been up and running here, we've, we've seen those same sort of statistics. We've been the most accurate temperature forecaster in Australia. Um, not only accurate, but also trusted. Um, so this weather century package that we're, we're looking at today, there's 18,000 subscribers to that worldwide. And so they're utilising for their particular industry and their particular weather challenges, they have an addition of weather century to support their decision making. We're going to look at the energy edition today, um, but we've got several different ones that just serve up the right sort of content to support those industries, whether it's construction or public safety or agriculture, there's an addition to suit your particular needs. Um, so accurate, trusted, but also available and reliable. We're there 24 seven, both with meteorological support, um, but also with system support to make sure that this platform doesn't go down. It's, um, it's supported 24 seven, um, so you can have confidence that the alerting, the displays, the, the content is available when you need it, um, because weather doesn't really care about the clock. It'll be going all the time, and so we need to make sure that our customers have access to weather all the time. So that's all I want to talk about the background, um, just how DTN fits in and, and where I fit into the, the picture. Now I want to get into weather century. Um, that was the topic today. Um, we're all about looking at how to mitigate weather risks using weather century online. So we'll have a bit of a closer look at that now and then get into a demonstration. Um, so regarding weather, weather century, um, it's a core component of our a full suite of weather decision support tools. And so you can see here, we offer a range of things depending on the business need from weather data feeds at the base level down the bottom there, we can serve up CSV files or XML files of observations or forecasts to feed directly into our uh, um, customer systems. Um, level two there is what we're talking about today. It's a browser based online decision support system, which utilizes those same weather data feeds, but then serves it up in a weather decision support tool. Um, that can be utilised on a PC, through a browser, on a tablet, on a mobile phone, um, 
and, and support business operations. We won't talk about today some of the other levels up there. Um, level three is the web service aspects to those same data sets. So rather than CSV files, we can serve up a polygon of Bureau of Met warning areas. We can serve up web features regarding lightning strokes to integrate into your own um, a GIS system or your own big screen displays. And if you need higher quality weather information, well then DTN can support that. The next level up is getting more into analytics. Um, and so we've got a suite of those for energy and for agriculture to allow, would, for us to look at the data and then extract out those insights through analytics um, to support decision making. So Weather Century does some of that, um, but there's more advanced things like um, a software tool that I'll mention a bit later called Storm Impact Analytics, which is in support of uh, electrical utilities and, and understanding how weather will impact on their particular assets and factor in vegetation and, and all the things rather than just weather. And then the last level at the top there is a full integrated solution. Um, and actually that can factor in at, at levels two, three or four there, but it's where we bring in one of our weather stations, we ingest that data, we archive it, quality check it, um, and then maintain a, a historical archive of that data as well as creating the forecast information to fit in any of those sub layers, either analytics, a, a, an API to bring it into a customer's own interface or directly through Weather Century, which we'll see a bit of today. But the, the key focus today is, is sort of at this, this browser-based level. Um, it's at the lower end of the complexity scale. It's something that's easy to use. It's designed to be just to start running. We've got plenty of YouTube videos that explain how to use it and user guides, but it's designed just to be um, a, a typical user experience. If you're used to a Google Maps interface, you can use Weather Century. This is what it looks like. We'll, we'll run through a demo shortly. I'll bring it up live and we'll get into it, but I just want to show you what I'm talking about to start with. Um, so this is just out of a standard browser. This is Chrome in this example. It works fine in Internet Explorer or um, Firefox. And so the main area there is a Google Maps interface. We can change the, the, the type of map there to a topography or a, a satellite view, um, whatever is preferable, and then overlaid with significant um, useful weather information. So on the bottom right hand corner there, I'll just switch over to a pointer. Um, so we can see down here that the current layers that are turned on, we've got the base map user locations. Uh, they've been decluttered so we can't see them at the moment. As you zoom in, we'd see them. The Bureau of Met radar, um, wind speed and direction arrows, again decluttered because we're zoomed so far out. As you zoom in, you just see more and more information. Um, lightning strokes, real-time information is shown there. We also have historical that we'll see later on, but this is real-time lightning. Um, the orange polygons are where Bureau of Met warnings were current at the time, so there's several marine ones there, plus inland over Tasmania. Um, we can see a couple of extra ones, um, some polygons over inland areas there, um, but the rest are, are coastal wind warnings. And then cold fronts and, and pressure systems. We can see high over the bite there. This was from yesterday, I think, um, and some cold fronts tracking across the south there, just to help give that extra understanding of the context for the weather you're seeing at the moment. The top up here is a suite of um, layers. As you move the mouse on the screen, these layers pop up and you can add on different weather layers or different map layers. Um, favourites just lets you set a, a particular zoom that you can jump to southeast Queensland and jump across to Perth and then jump down to Melbourne just by one click of the button um, rather than have to zoom and pan the, the map manually. Um, locations, we'll, we'll get into a lot of detail about that. We can see this pin down here around the Air Met offices in Melbourne. Um, and so you can define your own locations and get specific weather information for those spots, which we'll, we'll play with a lot during the demonstration today. And lastly, we'll play with these as well, the tools. Um, you can draw range rings, you can measure distances, um, you can get the latitude, longitude of the mouse location, or just support tools for making best um, use and understanding the weather content you're seeing on screen. Over on the left hand side are just different ways to visualise the map. We've defaulted to the weather visualisation tool which is the map based approach. There's also a dashboard. You can get in and, and ask questions in real time which is our online consulting capability which we'll, we'll come to later. Um, essentially DTN can be your own weather bureau basically. We can be there 24 7 and answer any critical weather questions you have about your particular location. Um, down the bottom here you can get in and look at historical data, there are a couple of ways you can get that through the, directly through the map by clicking on a location or you can just jump straight to this historical weather interface. And lastly slide shows, we won't talk about this today, 
Um, but Weather Century has a whole use case around big screen displays. Um, so in a control centre or operation centre, you can have the key content as, as scrolling slides up on the big screen so that no one needs to be interactively driving the system. Um, you can just have it up on the big screen and monitor it, whether there's anything significant happening at the time. Okay. So regarding just some of the features there, that was a quick overview and through the demo we'll tease out some of those, but just as a, a quick overview, um, the dashboard display gives you a, a quick overview of weather for your area. If you have defined a location, for example Sydney Airport in this case, you get a quick display of the radar and this could be on the big screen or, or on your desktop. Um, current radar, what the current conditions are like around um, that same location of interest. Um, so these are the Bureau of Met observations in this case, but if you had your own weather station that was um, integrated into the system, we are using your weather station here instead. Uh, we bring in that data and treat it the same as any other official source of information. Um, on the right hand side here is just a snapshot of anything significant at the moment. So at the moment there's no Bureau of Met warnings current for Sydney Airport based on this uh, dashboard when that screenshot was taken. Um, the wind monitor, there is a warning in place at this stage, it's exceeding the threshold that had been defined for this location, so it's turned red, so you can just at a glance see that there's something significant happening, but that's all clear for lighting. There's been no strokes within any of the monitored radii around that location, and so it's all clear. Down the bottom here, we do our own forecasting, and so we've got a system called Diecast that generates hourly forecasts out to 72 hours and daily forecasts out to 15 days. So we're seeing down here five hours of near-term forecast, so shout, this isn't live, I will say if there's anyone here from Sydney, um, but this is hourly forecast back when this screenshot was taken, um, and then down the bottom here, daily forecast for the coming five days as well. But through the map interface you can get into the full 15 day outlooks. Um, so it provides a quick overview, it lets you visualise in real time what is happening, um, and also be alerted to the same things. So you can either just use your eyes to, to visualise and make decisions around what you're seeing, but all that same content can have alerts triggered and sent to mobile phone, to email, or a push notification to a smartphone to get that information in real time um, along with action prompts. So it's not just lightning has occurred, but you can put in there your company's policy around what to do when lightning has occurred. So it's designed to be supporting decisions at all level um, of a business. Um, so here we're seeing Bureau of Met Radar, um, we're a registered user of the Bureau's data, um, we purchase from them and are supported to receive that information in real time. We've got some lightning strokes here that you can see overlaid on the radar, so you can see some of these cells are just showers um, and some of them are, um, there's electrification going on and we've got thunderstorms happening in these spots and we can see um, this one up here, for example, there's quite a few lightning strokes in there, it's quite an active one off the coast, with just one or two shell, um, strokes in this thundery shower that was further south of Sydney. And of course that would loop, you can see the looping functionality down here, you can um, track the, the path of the, the thunderstorm or the shower cell towards your area of interest. Lastly on the right hand side here, and we'll demo this later on, um, is the mobile app. And so you don't need to have the big screen or you don't need to have it on your desktop, you can take it with you. And so it's essentially the same functionality, a little bit cut down just through the, the smaller interface and the less processing power, but um, hopefully you can see the, the looping radar and lightning on the display here. Um, you get the same alerting functionality, you can get the same forecast information, um, it's just a cut down version of the full desktop. The other key feature, and we'll tease this out later on, is that that location can follow you around. Um, if it shows a blue dot, which we'll see later on, well then that is your current mobile phone location and any of the alerting that happens will be based on that location. So if you are travelling 200 kilometres um, on the road today to a customer site and there's lightning where you're heading to, that 200 kilometres away, it doesn't matter about the pin that you dropped um, at the AirMet location for example, it knows where your phone is and will tell you whether there's been lightning within um, X kilometres of your current location. Similarly, it will look for the nearest weather station and let you know if you've asked it to, it will let you know if there's any significant wind speeds or temperatures, um, it understands where you are and alert given that context. The other features that we'll, we'll go through a little bit today in the demonstration are around the, those alerting, um, that functionality. It's not predefined, it is configurable. 
um, you can set it to either your interests or to your business um, proces processes to make sure that the critical information is, is pushed proactively uh, to support decision making and also that it's consistently applied. Um, and so on the left hand side here, we're defining for a particular location what alerts are turned on. Here, lightning isn't turned on because it, it's probably a, an indoor location or it's not a lightning prone area, but heavy rainfall is turned on. If there's a 6% chance or greater based on DTN's forecast of 10 millimetres or more within a three hour rolling window ahead, well then an alert will be sent to, in this case, Matt's email but it could be to an SMS, to a, a phone, um, or it could be to an email group, or it could be to a push notification to a smartphone that has the app installed. Then the far right hand side here, you can also, for this particular alert type, define an action message. And so for rainfall, it might be that the action message is um, move all construction under shelter for the next three hours or until rain has cleared, or it could be um, bring cars in from the floodplain area prior to the onset of this rainfall. So these forecasts are being recreated every hour and if a new expectation occurs for whatever threshold is defined, well then that alert is generated and pushes out the message that you've defined. Um, if no alert is, if no message is defined, it will just let you know of that parameter being valid and we'll see an example of this later, but it does give that flexibility and that power to, to push out business rules to make sure people are doing the right thing as well as just alerts that go out to an external user, to a mobile phone or to an email, um, you can visualise some of these alerts within the system too, either on the web display or on the, um, on the app. And so you can make sure it highlights to you when temperatures are exceeding a certain threshold. So there might be less than eight degrees if you're a bit worried about frost uh, developing. Um, it might be greater than 28 degrees if you're worried about heat stress, um, wind thresholds, uh, a rainfall either amounts or probabilities occurring um, and we'll see how you utilise these shortly. Um, and lastly, you can monitor these multiple locations at a glance. So you can see, for example, here, if we look down at the wind monitor, um, I have two locations defined in this screenshot. I've got my mobile phone and also the location of my office. And in this case, both are all clear. There's no winds exceeding my threshold of 40 kilometres per hour. Um, but if it, if it was, if my location um, in my office was it was currently experiencing winds greater than 40 k's, well that would turn red. Whereas my mobile phone where I'm now, it's all clear, it'd stay green. And you can see the similar sorts of displays, these heads up um, decision support displays for Bureau of Met, watches warnings, advices, um, lightning and then rainfall. So let's jump into a, a demonstration now. Um, I've given a bit of a background about the sort of things that it can do. I just wanted to set the scene to understand that this isn't um, a free website that you, you might be currently using. Um, it is has had a, a fair bit of thought and it's undergone considerable evolution over time as our customers have given feedback and we've sought to best meet their needs. Um, and so the three key things I wanted to show you through today as we, we get in and use it under a different couple of different use cases is that it's designed to have an intuitive interface. You should Any um, person inside your business should just be able to pick it up and, and drive it straight away. Um, the fact that it has some powerful features, the alerting, the, the overlaying of the radar and the lightning, lightning and looping them um, and then triggering alerts um, from that same information. And also we can't really see it today but the robust infrastructure that this is built on. A head office is actually in the Midwest of the USA, which is close to some of the military areas, and that's um, got excellent internet capabilities because they have to remain on, online all the time. Um, and we also have redundant data servers. We have EOC facilities um, to shift to if there's any problems with the primary servers that um, already have failover capabilities, but we can then secondary failover to emergency op centers. So it's a robust, reliable infrastructure. So the three cases I thought we'd work through today um, first of all would be for a, a large business complex um, that have multiple staff on site and they ha they're exposed to some sort of weather risks, um, whether it's lightning, whether it's strong winds, whether it's heavy rainfall, whether it's extreme temperatures, um, there's some risks for that single location. Um, or the same thing would apply to if it was a, a cent if it was a business with multiple offices, for example, an office in Melbourne, an office in uh, Horsham, an office in Adelaide, you could have a centralised location just responsible for keeping abreast of the weather threats at all of the locations. 
and through weather sentry that's not a time um, intensive process because it's pushing the information to you um, and so it can either go to a centralised spot to then pass on when things are significant or it can be directly pushed off to the, the people on site at those locations in monitoring whether it's one or whether it's a dozen. The second case we'll, we'll work through is, is it's not so much you're worried about um, severe weather events, um, a severe thunderstorm or lightning, it might be that you've got a, a manufacturing facility that you need relative humidity to stay below a certain level or temperatures stay above a certain level. And Weather Sentry, through our accurate forecasting capabilities in there, can support that with um, real-time visualisation of forecasts that are updating every hour based on the most recent observations. The alerting functionality may or may not be significant there, it might just be the data, the quality of the data and being able to easily visualise that might be of more interest. And then lastly the, the mobile aspect, um, you might have field staff that are, are travelling around, um, the potential is always there to be where a lightning storm is, where a thunderstorm is about to pass over and if they're away from their desk, they don't have the normal tools, they might not be aware that a thunderstorm is is behind the building that they're working outside of right now and so having this proactive push information going to them about significant weather uh, could be a valuable workplace health and safety tool or assist with the operations they're doing there, if it's a construction job or, or something like that, you can make sure they've got information with them all the time. So let's jump across to Weather Sentry. Here it is now, um, I've zoomed out a bit here but we can see some of the layers, um, I'll just go across and be able to highlight a few things. So as we saw earlier, oh, I'm not going to be able to highlight, sorry, it needs the, the mouse to be able to see it, but then on the right hand side we've got the layer settings seeing what's turned on right now and these are all configurable, I can change the base map to be satellite for example um, and quickly switch the Google Maps base, um, base layer to, to be that, I'll switch it back just for the, the demonstration purposes to something um, a bit quicker to load um, and so and all of these have different configurations so for radar we can adjust the transparency, we can make it uh, a bit pixelated like the Bureau of Met raw data comes out or we can smooth it um, to make it look a bit nicer on a big screen, um, we can toggle on and off the coverage areas etc. So I won't go through all of these but you can see um, how easy it is to configure the layers that you're showing now. It also remembers what I showed recently um, and so one of the most recent ones I had was lightning um, and so I'll toggle that on, we can see some off the New South Wales coast there as that low moves away and also a cold front passing across Perth um, this morning um, and so we can see that's plenty of thunderstorm activity associated with that system um, approaching Perth now. I uh, also recently had the, the Sentinel bushfire hotspots uh, turned on and so oops I also clicked the map, just bear with me for a sec. And so we can see all those fire, bushfire locations have popped up there and if I hover the mouse over one of them we can see that this one up in Northern Territory has a particular latitude longitude and it tells us information about this. So this is an ad content, this is from Geosciences Australia but we know through talking to some of our utility customers and our forestry agriculture customers this is useful information for them so it's worth our while to, to bring it in some additional decision support layer inside with a century. Um, and you can see some of the other layers down here. If I zoom in a bit down around Perth where there's some interesting weather happening, I'll turn off the, the hotspots but we can see what's happening here. I'll just try looping, I'm not sure how it'll go through the webinar but um, we'll just watch the, the looping radar overlaid with the lightning and so we've got two significant features here. One is a cell that formed ahead of the main front here um, on a prefrontal trough has triggered some thunderstorm activity here that we can see tracking away to the south of Perth, a smaller cell up here that's weakened as it's hit land but this main one here just inland past um, Nanjar and, and tracking southeast. whereas the main front back here we're seeing plenty of um, squally showers uh, through this area here tracking towards the coast. So that, that looping is what we see now with, with other tools but it's harder to get overlaid with the lightning and have this up on a big screen so the people can just be monitoring the evolution of this system. You can see it's right up to date, up in the top right hand corner here we can see the, the validity time of this information. My computer is set to EST so that's the time zone we're seeing and it's right up to date, we're seeing the 11.30 radar data um, which we get into the system here faster than get on the Bureau website, we can just do the processing a bit faster to get into our systems and the lightning is real time too, it's right up to 11.31. Um, so that's the, the map interface that I want to show you, there's other pl plenty of other layers we can turn on here, so 
has the Bureau of Met, for example, issued a warning for this thunderstorm activity? Well, let's turn on the Bureau of Met alerts. Um, and as we turn on that layer here, the display quickly refreshes itself. And no, there's no severe thunderstorm warning present for this system at the moment. There's no orange polygon over the Perth area. Off the coast there is, and we hold the mouse over that area here, we can see there's a marine wind warning um, for gusty winds associated with this cold front um, moving across. And so we can quickly get into the information around this. Similarly, if I pause the, the loop and have a look at one of these lightning strikes, we can see that it was a positive stroke um, with amplitude of 31 kiloamps. If you need that level of information, um, you can just hover the mouse over and get into detail about some of these um, specific content here. Similarly, if you're worried about the onset um, of those stronger winds, if we look at Mandurah here, the weather station there, we're bringing in all Bureau of Met weather stations, plus any customer weather stations that we have access to, whether it's one of ours um, that we've installed for them and provided, um, or one that they have had and we can get access to the data and they're happy for us to display it, we can bring that in too. So here we can see just some of the standard MET parameters um, for that current observation there from Mandurah. Um, the 11.30 OBS isn't in just yet, but it will be shortly. Um, we're seeing the most recent OBS from that location there. So I mentioned before about um, the use case we're going to use here is perhaps there's a business complex and maybe you're a, a company in Perth and you've got the main office up in Perth but also a, a sub-branch down in Mandurah um, and so we want to keep an eye on both of those locations seeing as the weather can be different in both. So I'm quickly going to set up some alerting to let me know about weather impacts on my offices and it's as quick and easy as I'm going to add a location which drops this pin on the map. I'm going to drop that right up here um, in the per actually up in Osborne Park, that's going to be where our, um, our main office is. So we'll call that Osborne Park Head Office. And okay, that's now known by Weather Sentry. Weather Sentry understands that location and it's in the system and it will, it's capable to start displaying dashboard information as well as we can define alerts for that location. Have we also have a sub-branch that is down here at Mandurah, so I'm going to add another location. We just drop another pin, we just drag that and put it in the location we want, and we're going to call that the Mandurah sub-branch. And okay. So we now have both of those locations in the system. If I toggle off radar so we can see them a bit easier and lightning as well and I'll get rid of these official stations and the wind knobs, we can now see these two pins. We've got one up here at Osborne Park um, and one down here at Mandarin. So we can zoom right in and we could put it at the, I could have put it right at the, the proper street address. Um, but it's now in the system. So if I go over here, I want to do a bit with that information now. So now I have fixed locations set for Mandurah and Osborne Park and I could tweak the latitude, longitude if I wanted to get them to the exact location or define the, the, the street address directly. So that's good, they're both defined as six locations. I want to do three things now. I want to be able to um, have those locations monitored and let me know on a big screen when something significant is happening at those locations. I also want to be able to visualise the forecast for those and just be highlighted to the thresholds when they're exceeded. And then I want to be able to push some alerts to my team um, when things are happening at those locations. And so I'll do each in turn. I'll start with the location monitoring. That's quick and easy. This is all within Weather Century now. For both Osborne Park and Mandurah, I want to be alerted to lightning. I want to know if there's lightning within eight kilometres and that's going to be a warning for my staff that you need to take proactive steps right now. I'm not going to worry about wider ranges in this case. Um, this is just for a big screen display. I just want to know when there's lightning imminent. Um, and so I'm going to save those changes there and now both of those sites are now being monitored for lightning. I want to know when the Bureau of Met issues a watch or a warning. And so I'm going to turn on for Mandurah and Osborne Park. I'm not worried about advices, they are lower level ones. They might be a, a, a sheep weather alert or a, a bushwalkers advice. I'm not worried about those low level ones. I want to know about severe thunderstorm warnings, tropical cyclone, watches, those sort of things. So I'll turn them on for Osborne Park and Mandurah. I'm now being monitored for Bureau of Met warnings. I don't need to go check the Bureau website. I don't need to utilise a local council uh, SMS service. I'm utilising a single consistent business quality um, weather service to push that information to me. And it's integrated with these other things that I want to monitor. Lightning, the Bureau of Met warnings and also winds. 
that's the other significant thing I want to just monitor here on the big screen. Um, but significant winds, I want to know when winds either are exceeding or are expected to exceed 50 kilometres per hour, either mean winds or wind gusts, and we'll save those changes. So if I now jump back out, back to the home screen, nothing has changed here. All I've done is behind the scenes set some um, monitored locations for those. But now up here in the top right hand corner, this could be one of my slides or I could just leave it, leave the display set on this on one of my uh, monitors and I'm seeing now that, well there is lightning. Mandurah straight away has had a lightning stroke nearby and it's actually within three kilometres of Mandurah and one kilometre of Osborne Park. Um, the bomb alerts, as we saw earlier, there are no severe thunderstorm warnings, so that's all clear. However, for winds, Mandra is currently expecting winds of 51 kilometres per hour to start at 11 a.m. Western Standard Time. And so it's giving me extra information here that that's only a short term burst, expected to drop below 50 k's per hour at 12. So just for that one hour period, there is a threat of strong winds at that time. So this can now just display on a big screen. You can see we can add slides for these that will go on a slideshow, or this whole display could be a slide and just keep watch across a dozen different offices um, in my network. So that's one aspect there. The other aspect is I want to proactively push these alerts out. Um, if my staff aren't sitting in front of a big screen all the time, if they're out and about, I want to make sure they get an email alert. They've got emails on their smartphone, so let's push it out to their smartphone. And so that's an alert. That's, an inf that's information that's getting pushed outside this system to someone else. And so I'll just do it to myself, but for the Mandra sub-branch, what we're interested in there is any lightning occurring, heavy rain occurring, and a, a high likelihood of occurring, but it's 10 mils at the threshold. That causes some localised flooding um, in my example, and so I want to know that. And I'll, I'll give the model a bit of t uh, lead time, so within six hours if anything's happening there. Also winds. I want to know about winds of in this case, Mandra has a, a bit of a higher threshold when I, with my staff there. I want them to know when the winds are approaching that 50k per hour threshold, so I'm going to make it 40. And I could specify a direction if there's something I was particularly worried about, but here it's any direction. And so again, within I want a six hour window looking forwards of this risk of wind speeds exceeding 40k's per hour. For this Mandra office, I'm lucky that there is a weather station nearby, so I also want to be alerted if there's any observed winds greater than 50 kilometres per hour. That's what I know, there is going to be some damage around from branches coming down, so I want a forecast of 40 k's just so I'm aware that the threat is there, but when it actually occurs at 50, I want to get an alert to that. And I'll save those changes. Oh, sorry, I forgot to define a recipient. Um, because I did this new location, I need to tell it who to send it to, and I'll send it to Matt's email. It could be to my mobile phone for a push notification, or it could be to my mobile phone for an SMS. Um, but just remember all my settings there, save the changes. I'm now ready to receive these alerts anytime something happens. So that will go to my email, either to my, my email on my phone or on my desktop, and I'll also I can track them up here just to see what alerts have been issued. At the moment, there haven't been any. Uh, for any of my locations, let alone for Mandra on its own, um, but we'll track, we'll just keep an eye on that through the, the webinar today, just in case any are issued with that um, cold front approaching. So uh, hopefully you can see there just how easy it is to, for that use case, this large business complex with multiple staff on site being exposed to weather risks, how easy it is to define the locations you're interested in, specify what parameters you're worried about, whether it's lightning, whether it's uh, wind speeds, whether it's rainfall or temperatures, um, and how easy it is then to keep abreast of those changes. Whether it's on a big screen display like this, where you can just keep an eye out for the, the red buttons, it could also be through the dashboard display that I haven't shown yet, but I'll quickly load that up. And if I go to Mandra, we're seeing here that there's no Bureau of Met warnings, the wind monitor is active. Not only are winds expected to exceed that we saw earlier on the location, but it's also currently at 66 k's per hour. So the, the wind monitor is red. Um, and similarly, lightning. There's been three strikes within eight kilometres in the last 60 minutes. Um, I've got an all clear of 30, and so as soon as there's no strikes for 30 minutes, it's going to send me another message through my alerting system um, that it's all clear that we haven't looked at that, but that's another part of the functionality. Of on this dashboard that we, we saw a screenshot early, but we're seeing that the current real-time radar, we're seeing the current observations from the nearest weather station, 
we're seeing the stats for today so far, the max so far, the min so far, etc., and then what happened yesterday, just with a, a quick look. So I won't dwell more on that one. That's the the that initial use case around monitoring multiple locations and keeping abreast of the weather parameters that are in to you. The second um, use case that I had was around business processes. It might not be the severe weather things. Um, you might be well covered with them. You might be an indoor facility and it's not affected by severe weather as much. Um, but you might have a manufacturing facility that needs outdoor ambient temperatures not to exceed 38 degrees or you need the humidity not to exceed a certain level. And so weather century can certainly assist with that. This, the base way to do that would be, and let's go somewhere where um, weather's a bit more benign, we'll jump over to southeast Queensland where I am, um, and let's say at Toowoomba, let's have a look at the forecast for Toowoomba. Uh, I just need to turn on the official stations again, and we can see um, Wellcamp Airport and also Toowoomba Airport, so we'll have a look at that one. And as we call this up, it defaults to whatever I looked at last time, and so in this case it's historical weather for the Toowoomba Airport weather station, um, but I can also have a look at the local forecast here. And there's three ways I can view it. I can look at the daily outlooks out of those full 15 days. And so this isn't Bureau of Met content, this is our proprietary DTN content where we're creating our own forecast and certainly happy to provide information about that if anyone's interested. Um, I can look at the hourly detail, which is consistent with those dailies. It's got the same max and the same min and the rainfall adds up to the same, but you get into this um, hourly time resolution. The grey boxes at the front are observed and it's blending into the the forecast um, from the, the current time onwards. And so these hourly forecasts are recreated every hour and are forward error correcting the, any biases we're seeing in the computer models to blend smoothly from the observations into the forecast. Um, some other sources of information you might have seen on free websites, for example, just do this once a day. They just create this, this hourly forecast or three hourly forecast once a day um, and that's it. Or as the DTN approach, we're always assessing the latest observations to ensure the accuracy of that forecast in the short term and keeping them blended into the longer term 15 day outlooks as well. Um, and so here you, you notice something interesting here, these, these red shades, but I, I want to know what they are. And so I'm going to jump out of here and just set them to what I want them to be. And this is how we can monitor, for example, for a manufacturing facility, um, the, the times when something significant is expected and that's this forecast thresholds button here under settings and so I can quickly define I want to know about temperatures when they're dropping too low. If they're going to get below five degrees that's significant for me. I want to know when um, the feels like temperature, the sort of the heat stress measure is going to be very high. Um, we have to implement um, increased hydration and those sort of things in a manufacturing plant when we're expecting that and we also adjust rostering and things like that so I want to know when it's going to be high. Uh, wind speeds aren't of interest to me, I'm going to turn them off completely. Um, dew point as a measure I'm not too worried about, it's the humidity I'm worried about and so whenever humidity is going to exceed uh, 80 percent I want to just be, have that highlighted to me. Um, rainfall, we're under cover, we don't care about rainfall so we'll turn both of those off and save those changes. So now when I visualise back here for Toowoomba I'm just going to have those specific parameters highlighted to me and I know straight away and as soon as I call up the interface that humidity is of interest to me sometime in the coming three days. Humidity label is red, that is of significance. Temperature's not, feels like it's not, it's not dropping too low for the temperatures, frost isn't a risk, it feels like it's not rising too high, heat stress isn't a risk, but I know straight away humidity is. Whereabouts? Well we can just have a look and we can see that Sunday morning, as the temperature drops a bit low, the humidity is up, that, the, the dew point's slightly elevated, they're just getting close enough to increase humidity up to that threshold. And so it's straight away, it's a, it's a visual prompt that this is reaching that threshold. The third way I mentioned before, we've seen the daily, the hourly, you can also see this graphically. And so I can quickly run down these um, and just, whoops, and quickly scroll down these and see that um, in the short term, everything's okay. And it, it's only showing the short term in this one. If you wanted to get into the, the detail of the, um, the full 72 hours, you wouldn't be looking at this graphical option. Um, you'd be looking at the, the hourly time step. But here for the next 24 hours, things are looking good for all of my parameters. There's no red highlights. Um, if it was exceeding the threshold in this spot, it would just show this window here highlighted red. 
example. So that's what I'll show you with use case number two, just showing how if you've got particular business processes that are affected by weather conditions, you can easily visualise them inside Weather Century and support that decision making process, both with observed values and having a high quality trusted source of forecast information to base those decisions on. The third um, use case, and this might take a little bit of setting up, let me just, um, and that's the mobile aspect. So I quickly just need to reconnect to my phone, just give me one sec. Here we come, it's coming online. And so this is a live view of my mobile. It's an Android device, but the app works on either Android or iPhone devices. And I'm just gonna start up Weather Sentry. And so the use case here is, is field staff that are out and about. And so just having a desk-based solution won't be optimal for them. Having monitored locations won't be optimal either because they're moving. Um, you can't just have a fixed location that moves. What you can have though, is you can link a mobile phone to your Weather Sentry license. And so here, if I go to the maps, we can see um, it zooms to wherever I last was, but if I click on, hopefully you can see the, the mouse moving here. If I click on the, the target in the top right there, it will zoom to my location and show the blue dot where I am. So I'm actually up on the Sunshine Coast today. Um, and but we can, we can move the map around and I can define alerts for that particular location. And so if I'm a mobile worker, I can not only visualise what weather's coming, for example, I can change the location up here. To be Perth. And it will zoom across and it will show me the, the current activity here. And we see two things here. First of all, we can see the same content. We can see the looping radar overlaid with lightning. Uh, I might actually have the lightning turned on. No, we just seem to have the radar at the moment. But we can also see those two locations I added. Weather Sentry is completely consistent. Whatever you do in one location, if it's linked to your Weather Sentry license, you're gonna see it in other areas. So you can just have continual faith that you're getting this, this good quality, reliable information all the time. Um, of course, I do want to see lightning. Um, that's my main threat while I'm out on about. So I'm just going to come in here to the settings, turn the lightning layer on and go back. And it's just going to now show me the lightning. So that's pretty much all I want to show on, on this feature here. Um, there's plenty of functionality to this app, but we're just running a bit short on time on the, the webinar today. But if we jump out, we can see that there's other options. So I can get into a dashboard display. I can look at the local forecast. I can get in and define my alerts for my particular location and also see ones that have been issued. So in this case, you can remember earlier, we set some alerts for Mandurah and we've actually received two now. And so if I jump back over to Weather Century itself and go up to these alerts here, some alerts have come in for forecast wind speed and observed wind speed. Um, you can't see what I'm doing off screen, but I've actually also received some alerts over in my emails. Uh, but I don't think I can get them on to this screen. Sorry about that, but yes, they have been received. So yep, the system's working as expected. But back over here in, in the app, um, I can also define the settings for my mobile phone. So for my mobile, I can define that I wanna be alerted to lightning when it's within eight kilometers and have some, some other advisories, how long I need to know till it's all clear, till there's been no lightning strikes near my phone, so I know I can exit my vehicle or get out from shelter and go about my work again. Um, similarly, you would have seen here this quiet periods. I also don't need alerts between 9 p.m. and 6 a.m. and so I can set some quiet periods here just by setting the start and end time and just repeating that. Um, sorry, specify quiet periods and I repeat that just on weekdays or I can have it every day of the week and those sort of things. So the YAP approach where it lets you get these push notifications to your phone has been designed again with users in mind to make it support your, your business processes. So that's what I wanted to show you today in this demonstration of Weather Sentry. Um, as you can see, there's quite a few features here. We probably didn't cover it all today, but either Peter and the Emmet team or, or the DTN team could certainly answer more questions. Um, there are a couple of other ways that Weather Sentry can be used that I'll, I'll quickly just touch on before I pass back over to Peter. Um, if I can just call up the display again. And so that's some of the other uses that people use for Weather Sentry. Um, it's that online consulting aspect. Um, 
having expert weather advice um, in real time. You can just type in a, a question through Weather Centre in the desktop app or on your mobile phone, um, and within 15 minutes, you'll get a response from a qualified meteorologist 24 seven about your weather query. And so if it's a critical operational decision or a planning decision, you can get that expert met input. Um, you might not want the, the real-time visualisation of lightning. You might, however, want 9 a.m. every day, just get an emailed summary of any lightning strokes that occurred within two kilometres of a key asset, uh, an electrical transform or a, an antenna of, that's of critical um, um, use in your business. Whatever the asset is, we can send these daily summaries of those lightning strokes to save you time in having to hunt through historical data or well, first of all, having to try and find the historical data, Weather Sentry can support those decision tools. We've got a whole implementation of Weather Sentry just for helicopters, for example. It, we get the transponder information, we can track the helicopters and then issue alerts based on the forward motion of that helicopter where it's expected to be in the next 30 minutes, 60 minutes, based on lightning, radar, bureau warnings, etc. Um, there's a whole consulting arm to what we do and we have a tool there that you can visualise inside Weather Sentry called Weather Event Index. And so if you let us know your territories of interest, then we can let you know which of those are at level one where there's nothing significant, right up to level five where the thresholds you have defined for wind speed, heavy rainfall, thunderstorm activity, whatever weather parameters affect you, we can give you that information to support your decision making process over multiple days, but still keep it within that same weather century interface. Um, you can run your own network of weather stations. We've got multiple ones that we're rolling out now for customers in Australia, around South East Queensland, around South West WA, around South Australia. Um, but su supplementing the Bureau network with multiple stations. Get down for agriculture, get down to the field level for um, utilities. Understand the peak gust out of any thunderstorm event, not just what the Bureau network measured, what actually happened from those thunderstorm events. Um, and lastly, storm impact analytics. That's a whole other offer that brings in weather content, vegetation information, and utilities asset information and their outages to combine them through machine learning techniques to give detailed information and analytics to support crewing, support return to service, support government inquiries, um, support any of your business tools. That'll do us for today. Um, thank you for, for participating. Thanks everyone for attending today. And finally, thanks Matt for your time. Thanks everyone, bye-bye.